Whitewater family, we have missed you, and we are so excited about the launch of Home Church coming up right around the corner. We believe this Home Church model will empower us to do community within the context of our natural relationships. And as Hebrews 10, 24 through 25 tells us, let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds, not forsaking the gathering and encouraging one another. And we want to do just that in this next season. When we look back at history, we see that this home church model is what has thrived in the most challenging of environments. We're certainly walking through one right now and are so excited about the transformation that will happen as we move into this next season of home church. We believe home church will empower us to do community within the context of our natural relationships at any place where people can be gathered. We know that doing life in community helps us combat things like fatigue and grief, loneliness and depression, all kinds of things that many of us have been experiencing in this last season. During this COVID-19 crisis, we don't want you to do life alone. If hosting home church is something that excites you, we want you to know that you do not have to be a professional, you don't have to be a theologian, you do not have to be a perfect person to jump into that role. In fact, all we ask is that you simply love people and we will equip you with the tools and the resources you need to be successful in leading a home church in this next season. If you'd be interested in learning more about that, go ahead and click the link below or email us at info at whitewaterchurch.org. In this season, we know everyone has different comfort levels. It's also summer, which means different rhythms for everyone. In this season, we want to provide various options for you to connect beyond home church. Here are a few ways. Online church, meetups, and drive throughs With online church, you can continue tuning in from the comfort of your own home. We also have drive through events and meetup events as opportunities to connect. With online church, you can keep tuning in from the comfort of your own home. At a drive through event, you'll come through in your own car, wave and say hi, and perhaps receive some prayer. At a meetup event, you can come connect with people face-to-face -face with social distancing, of course. For more information about any of these events, go ahead and check out our social media pages or email info at whitewaterchurch.org. We want this to be a season of growth for our church. We know we'll be learning things over the next couple of months that will help us as we move into the fall. We hope you experience growth too, and we know that when we gather, we grow. So our prayer is that Home Church would bring all kinds of growth and connection, community and joy as we experience the transformational power of Jesus within the context of Home Church. Hi guys, welcome to Whitewater Church Online. Thank you so much for joining us. We're going to do some singing, and we're going to hear a sermon, and then afterwards, um, stay tuned for Whitewater Kids online. It has never been easier to invite someone to church from the comfort of your own home. Copy and paste the link and send it to someone who you think could really use it.
shining as the sun. We've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first be. Hey, Whitewater friends and family, welcome to a place you can belong before you believe. That just means that you can explore faith um, before you maybe believe what we believe. So we just want to invite you on that journey, and our goal is to help you take the next step in your spiritual journey toward Jesus. Now, uh, Whitewater is a Jesus-centered church, and what we mean by that is that we see Jesus as the primary lens by which we look at the world, Jesus' teachings on ethics, Jesus' teachings on the kingdom of God and spirituality, his teachings about just humanity in general are the most amazing and revolutionary teachings um, that I I think historically have ever been taught. And the most amazing thing about the teachings of Jesus is that he actually embodied and modeled what he taught. No other teacher taught the self-giving, self-sacrificial love that Jesus taught and demonstrated it by dying on behalf and for his disciples, his followers. Uh, There's never been anybody like him. And so we base all of our way of life and our teaching on the Jesus way. And if you've never explored the way of Jesus, you've never actually read his teachings and read about his life, I want to encourage you to uh, join the conversation. Um, And so we're a Jesus-centered church. We're centered on him, but we're also sent by Jesus to bless a broken world. We're going to jump into a four-week series by really looking at a story uh, about Jesus and a story that I think speaks uh, to our day and to our times. Before I do, I want to tell a story. Now, I remember in high school, a particular homecoming um, event. You know, the ones where everyone's in the gym and the homecoming king and queen uh, walk down the, the aisle. We were having one of those assemblies, and I remember these friends walking down the gym floor with their, one of their best friends um, who was in a wheelchair. Now, his name was Ken, and he had been uh, voted the homecoming king for that year. Um, and at a recent camp, um, Ken had become a paraplegic. Kids were diving into a mud puddle, and when Ken dove, um, he never stood up on his own again. He was paralyzed from the neck down uh, with limited use in his index fingers. And um, it was a terrible and permanent injury in high school that changed his whole life. That year, he had been voted homecoming king. And he, the week leading up to the home, homecoming assembly, our rival school mascot had gone missing. It was a life-sized wood carving of a red hawk. And at that time, our, our new school um, had no school spirit, so we're at this assembly. I don't think Ken was excited. People weren't excited to be there. It had been a tough year. In the middle of the assembly, some friends ran from the, from the bleachers with a, a box and gave it to Ken. Now, with the help of his friend Jake, Ken uh, opened the present and reached into the box. And with his friend, they, they pulled out the red hawk. The gym erupted. I'd never seen anything like it at our school. We had students that were cheering, screaming, crying with laughter. There were teachers that were smiling. Um, there were, the janitor was laughing. Ken's face was glowing. And the principal was fuming. As school spirit was being born, and a rivalry between Squalicum High School, my high school, and Bellingham High School was being forged, the principal was furious. What she and a few others missed, because they were focused on the disruption as uh, an offense instead of a disruption as an opportunity, 
was that these imperfect young high school rascals weren't ruining homecoming. They were carrying their paralyzed friend and including him in having the highlight of a glorious moment in front of the whole high school in a time where he was having to grow through the reality of a permanent injury. No one in that high school ever forgot that moment. I want to talk to you today about a story centering on Jesus, about the power of friendship and the power found in Jesus Christ. So let's begin. Mark chapter 2, um, verses 1 through 3. We're just going to cover one little chunk, but it's a powerful chunk of scripture. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn there, you can read along. Jesus went back again to Capernaum, where after a few days, word got around that he was at home. So word got around that Jesus, the healer, is home, and a crowd gathered. It's not a surprise. So that the people couldn't even get near the door as he was telling them the message, the message of the kingdom of God, the message of God's love. And in verse 3, it says this, a party arrived, four people carrying a paralyzed man, bringing him to Jesus. I just want to look at these three verses. I think that they have something very, very powerful for us today in these strange, hard times in COVID-19. Now, first thing I want to highlight is some cultural historical realities. So you have these four friends carrying their paralyzed friend on a, on a stretcher. We, we don't know how this man was paralyzed. It could have been from birth. It could have been from a sickness or it could have been from some kind of injury. And in this culture, often people who were paralyzed or who had some kind of infirmity, um, the, the, the common belief was that they had done something to deserve that kind of injury or that kind of problem. And so there was a social shame, a social stigma that came along with this kind of problem, this kind of physical um, issue. And um, you can imagine just maybe some of the shame that this man had carried, maybe his whole life, or maybe these were his friends, and, you know, he hung out with them and worked with them, and and maybe there was an injury, and and his life had never been the same. And you can imagine just some of the shame that maybe this man was carrying. Imagine the emotional loss of hope and potential, uh, a potential life that had been taken from him, feelings of anger, feelings of helplessness and hopelessness. We also know that somebody had been taking care of him for these long years, or maybe it was fairly recent, we don't know, but somebody had been taking care of him despite the social stigma um, and, and caring for this man. And he had four friends who cared deeply enough about him that they were going to physically carry him to Jesus. I just love that image. I heard these four friends, maybe he had, he had other friends, but they weren't willing or they were too busy or maybe they thought his situation was too hopeless uh, it wasn't worth it, um, and they had other things to do, but there were four friends that heard about this healer, Jesus, and they didn't know for sure if Jesus was going to heal them, but they had faith that it was worth the try, and these friends lifted this grown man up in his stretcher, on his mat, that had become his place of shame, his place of injury, his place of hurt, his place of deepest pain, and they lifted him up and carried and were bringing him to Jesus. They were determined to bring him to Jesus. I love this story. Have you ever tried to pick up a grown, grown-up adult? Like, it's hard. My daughter is seven years old, and she's, uh, she's been ambushing me recently. She'll just, like, jump up from behind the couch, like, Dad, carry me. And she's getting almost too big. Like, and it, it's, I'm like, Novella, you're killing my back. And I, I'll, I'll set her down, or I'll try to throw her. Like, she wants me to throw her on the bed or throw her on the couch. And it's killing me these days. You know, imagine picking up a grown-up man. His friends grew, uh, picked him up and took him toward Jesus. I want us in this time to to realize in COVID-19, people, your friends of yours, friends of mine, people we know, acquaintances, people we work with are going to go through seasons and moments where they are paralyzed. Maybe not physically, 
like this man, but they are paralyzed financially, paralyzed relationally, paralyzed mentally and emotionally, paralyzed because of grief, paralyzed because of fatigue, um, paralyzed politically, and they can't move. They can't get up on their own. There's people who will, if they haven't already, there are people who will lose their business. There are people who are going to lose their homes. There are people who are going to lose loved ones lose friendships, and they're going to get hit so hard that they won't be able to get up. Who is going to carry them? Who will be the stretcher bearers that are going to pick them up and bring them to Jesus? Be determined. Doesn't matter what the social stigma is. Doesn't matter how busy. Doesn't matter all the objections we might have, but we are going to help them get to Jesus? I think it's an important question. There will likely be a time this year, if it hasn't happened already, this year, where you are going to be too paralyzed to move. I mean, you're going to get hit with something emotionally, relationally, financially, spiritually, and you're going to be hit so hard, you're not going to, you, you're not going to think you can get back up. So who is going to pick you up? When you can't get up, who's going to carry you? A few years ago, me and my wife got knocked down so hard. Um, we were paralyzed. We couldn't get up. Um, when we lost our, our, our twins at 21 weeks in the pr- pregnancy, uh, both Sarah and I, uh, we didn't know what to do. I mean, just emotionally, spiritually, uh, we were down. And... Uh, we had friends who would not give up on us. We had a, a church that rallied behind us. We had people that were stretcher bearers for us when we couldn't move, who carried us. I mean, prayed for us. Uh, note after note after note of encouragement and love. The conversations, um, people who just blessed us and dropped food off and dropped things off that we didn't, we, we hadn't, would never have thought of or uh, that we didn't deserve. And these just these friends just kept up, and it didn't just it wasn't just one week. It was it was a it was a season that we were carried by friends in our church, and we were paralyzed. We couldn't get up on our own. I had, a, I had another friend who told me recently about his son. Um, said it was the worst day of his life. His son came to him at work, and he could see through the door of his work, the little window, that something was really wrong. And when they began talking, he left the meeting and began talking with them. His son just fell to the ground, sharing about how he discovered the infidelity of his wife in their marriage. And their marriage was just ruptured and broken. And um, my friend said, I, I don't think my son would have made it if it wasn't for his friends. He said his friends carried him through that period of time. He, his friends, he said his friends uh, scheduled, made sure they scheduled somebody to be with his son for six to nine months. So his son either had someone with him at his home as he was going through this struggle, or he was, there were friends who opened their homes so that he could stay there through this season. Uh, he said he, he, his son probably went to Mayday. He wouldn't have his son here today if it wasn't for those friends who carried him when he couldn't move, when he was paralyzed. Let me ask you, who will you carry in this season? When they're paralyzed, when they're broken, when they can't see a, a purpose for moving forward, or they, they just physically can't, who in your life Will you be determined to help no matter what? And who in your life will carry you? What relationships have you built so that you have people that come hell or high water are going to pick you up, carry you toward Jesus? There's going to be a moment in all of our lives, especially here in COVID-19, where we need that. And I don't want you to be alone. I think this image of these friends, this loyal love, this compassion in these friends for their paralyzed friend is like a picture of the church. 
it's the pic best picture of what the church can be at times. Uh, where, where, where someone is so paralyzed they can't move, and we come around them, we lift them, and we walk with them, and, we, and we, we bring them to Jesus. If they're limping, if they can't move, we get them there. Not to enable them, but to empower them to find the healing love of Jesus, to see hope where they're hopeless, to see light in the darkness, and to move forward into a life where they can begin to walk again. I was broken, I was lost in all of my own, then you found me and called me your own, you were broken, you were sent to seek and to say, all that my sin was left. set me free we were hopeless but your love changed everything from orphans to children of the king so tell your friends there's a kingdom come a holy love and a place for us we're broken people learning to love We're broken people learning to love Broken people loved by a God Who was broken for us We're broken people learning to love Broken people loved by a God Who was broken for us Hey guys, Michael Hart here. I miss seeing you guys' face so much. So till then, here's my face. Uh, we just wanna thank you so much for your generosity during this time, especially financially. So if you wanna partner with us financially, you can go to our website or you can just mail a check. We cannot do this without you. If you're interested in a more tangible way to be able to bless the community, email us at info at whitewaterchurch.org and we will connect you with one of our blessing teams. Love you so much. Take care. Next week, we're going to be looking at how these friends um, got their friend to Jesus and how they got him through all the barriers to get to Jesus. And um, I want to encourage you today, though, to spend some time uh, 
with your spiritual family, or maybe just your, uh, maybe it's a, a roommate or, or your family that you're, you're living with, and, and ask a few questions. I think these are really important spiritual questions to ask. Um, what is God saying to you about who will be your stretcher bearers? Like who do you have in your life that you can really count on? And, and are you able to be vulnerable enough to ask for help? when you're when you're paralyzed the other thing is um who in your sphere of friends who in your spiritual family um will you carry and and do you have eyes to see and know when they're paralyzed when they're down and out when they can't move and they need to be carried um, I want to encourage you to build those kinds of relationships where you have that kind of transparent conversations because we, we're not designed to do this alone. We love you guys so much. You can click on the link for Whitewater Kids. Have a great day. See you next week.